looking at a gospel or a kingdom, very often when we think of a gospel and we speak about the gospel, it is all about Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on the cross, the atonement and things like that. And that is the reason for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But somewhere in the process, the whole gospel or the kingdom has kind of uh, vanished or gone into the background. And so we want to look at the importance of this whole concept of the gospel or the kingdom as central to the uh, gospel message. So if we look in the gospels, the term kingdom appears almost 150 times or so in the New Testament, bringing out the contrast which is there between the kingdom of this world and the spiritual kingdom of which we are a part of. And this tension between the two kingdoms is absolutely vital for the gospel. And what we are preaching and teaching people is to enter into the kingdom of God. And it's not just about the atoning sacrifice, but through the atoning sacrifice to come into the kingdom of God and to be part of the kingdom. Yet this concept of the kingdom of God is little understood, mainly because when you're reading the Bible, very often it seems to be as if it's in the future and sometimes as if it's in the present. And so this whole idea of it being present with us now and already being with us and then being coming in to us in the future, so it creates a bit of a confusion in our minds. Now, what we really need to understand is that the kingdom of God has come with Jesus Christ and has become a part of us. It is there. But the fullness of the kingdom is something which will be experienced in the second coming and in the future. But we are already in the kingdom of God now and we are experiencing the blessing of being in the kingdom of God very much in the present. It is something like I'm depositing the sermon now in you. You listen to the sermon, you hear it, you know, the sermon is over. But over a period of days, as you meditate on it and think about some of the issues which you didn't agree with or whatever it is, the fullness will come slowly over a period of time. And you look at the kingdom of God like that, that you are entered into the kingdom of God and slowly you're moving towards the fullness of experiencing what the kingdom of God is meant to be. But so that, in other words, what we are saying is that the kingdom has come. It is already here in our midst but will be understood fully in the future when Jesus Christ comes and takes us into the fullness of the kingdom at the second coming. So this is the basic concept of the kingdom of God. Now, if you look at the preaching which was done in the New Testament, in Matthew 4, 23, we read about Jesus preaching the gospel. And it says that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. So here you find that the gospel which Jesus preached was about the kingdom. Whereas today, the gospel which we preach is always about the cross and rarely about the kingdom. Whereas that was the essential preaching which Jesus did was about the kingdom. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So the good news which Jesus was sharing and which Jesus was saying that we need to proclaim all over the world, this good news is the good news of the kingdom of God, having come and being in our presence with us. And that we have access to this kingdom of God today and in the now, not something in the future when we die or something like that but we have access into this kingdom of God now. And that access is through the cross and through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so that is basically what the gospel which was preached by Jesus and his apostles. Now, after John was put in prison, it says in Mark's gospel, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, today we ask the average Christian, for them, the gospel or the good news is about the atoning sacrifice of Jesus and about the cross. Whereas when you find that what the apostles were preaching, it was always about the kingdom of God. Then you find later, uh, Matthew 10, 7, 
that when Jesus sends the apostles to go and preach in Judea and in the Israel, Jesus says, as you go, preach saying that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the message which they were supposed to preach was the message about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven being available to people. And that's why they need to repent and turn away from this uh, world which we are a part of and turn to the kingdom of God. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what Nicodemus was seeking was the kingdom. And what Jesus was offering is the kingdom. And what Jesus said that if you want to be a part of this kingdom, you need to be born again. And so we need to realize that as believers who have surrendered our life to God, we are now members of this kingdom and we need to try and understand what is this kingdom and what is its implication for us. Now, interestingly, you will find that while in the gospel, the water preached was the kingdom, once you move to Acts of the Apostles, there's a slight change. So the difference is the gospel is before the crucifixion of Christ and the Acts of the Apostles onwards is after the crucifixion of Christ. So when we come to Acts of the Apostles in Acts 8.12, it says that when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So you find that now the message has been broadened to include both the kingdom of God as well as the Jesus Christ, his work and his atonement, both become the part of the message which we preach. And that is something which we need to realize that we are not just talking about Jesus Christ and going to heaven. We are talking about Jesus Christ and the atoning sacrifice and the entry to the kingdom of God now here in the present so that we become a part of this community of God which is there. And that is absolutely vital for us to know. Similarly in Acts 28, 31, it says preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. This is what Paul was doing in Rome when he was there as a prisoner. And so we need to be also preaching the kingdom of God. And what I find disturbing, that we rarely preach about the kingdom of God. We only talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in effect, we have reduced the message by half. And I think that creates a weakness in the gospel and a weakness in the church, which we need to be careful about. Now, if we look at uh, what actually happened, why this uh, tendency to ignore the kingdom happened, the Roman Catholic Church, they recognized the reality of the kingdom of God. And the Roman Catholic Church used to have the statement that the church is the kingdom of God. And therefore, if when you accept Jesus Christ, you become a member of the church. And it is the church which guarantees you the salvation and of you being a part of God's family and being a part of God's kingdom. Now, when the Reformation took place and when that kind of... Uh, Rebellion took place against the Roman Catholic Church. They started, they started struggling with this whole concept of the kingdom of God because the Roman Catholic Church was saying the Roman Catholic Church is the kingdom of God and what are the Protestant churches and where are they? So they started looking at this verse, John 18, 36, which says that my kingdom is not of this world. And so they started looking at the kingdom of God as something which exists in heaven or which exists in some other place, not necessarily now. And so the kingdom of God slowly in the minds of the people got postponed to the future. And the Christian life became a waiting for the second coming or waiting for death, whichever is first, so that you leave this world permanently and go and be in the heavenly abode. So that was the kind of concept which was becoming, coming into the Protestant church which is actually totally wrong because what Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is something which has come. The kingdom of God has come and is there in our midst. So salvation as a result of this loss of the concept of the kingdom of God, salvation tended to become very individual. I as an individual accept Jesus Christ and I get salvation and the kingdom was kind of forgotten. If I am getting salvation by accepting Jesus Christ, why worry about the kingdom? 
when the Jesus comes, he will take me into the final perfect kingdom. For the time being, I don't need to worry about the kingdom so much. And so what happened was in the Protestant church, the salvation became individualized. A kind of a secondary add-on. If you want, you can have a church. If you don't want, you don't need a church. A church is kind of optional. What really is needed is your personal salvation and your personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, actually, there's a lot of truth in the, in the statement that what is important is the personal encounter with Jesus Christ and personal salvation. But there is a great loss in not understanding that that personal salvation and that personal encounter with Jesus Christ leads us to become a member of the kingdom of God. And we need to start experiencing the reality of the kingdom in our lives because that is what Jesus Christ wants for us. In fact, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his salvation or his righteousness. So the cross is the door into the kingdom. And Jesus was saying, we need to be seeking the kingdom or wanting to enter into the kingdom all the time. That is basically what needs to be our goal and our focus. But what happens is we get stuck at the cross and we say, praise the Lord, Jesus has died for my sins. So I've got salvation and I just forget about the kingdom. And I kind of live at the cross and don't go beyond that. Whereas it's essential for us to move on to Pentecost, experience the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and enter into the kingdom and start seeing the kind of things which God is doing in his kingdom for us, <clears throat> and start experiencing the reality of the kingdom in our lives. So that is something which is very, very important, but which somehow has been getting neglected in the Protestant church. So what happened, if you look at John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So basically, Jesus is saying, your discipleship, the fact that you are a follower of Jesus, is seen in the love which you have for the community of God and for the people of God. And this is the commandment which Jesus has given us, that we need to love one another, and we need to love the fellow disciples, and need to become a part of the community where we have fellowship together. That is a command given by Jesus. It's not an option. It's not an optional add-on. But it is absolutely central to my Christian life. And it is central to my testimony, because Jesus says, by this people will know you are my disciples. Or by this people will know that you are a Christian because of the kind of love which you have for other Christians and for the kind of love which you have as a community for each other. See, yesterday I was saying that when we looked at the study on generosity in India, the community they spoke about were the Sadhajis, the Sikhs. But the community they should have been speaking about are the Christians. Because that is the command which Jesus has given to us directly that we need to be having that kind of love and fellowship for one another within the church and within the community of God. So the commandment of Jesus is to love one another or to be part of the kingdom or community of love. There is absolutely no gospel without the church. Because what is the gospel? What is the good news? The good news is the kingdom of God. And the physical manifestation of the kingdom of God is the church and the community of God's people. And so if that is central to the gospel, we need to understand that we, this, this cannot be an add-on, but needs to be absolutely central to our Christian life, that we are part of a community, and we love the people in the community, and we manifest that love in different ways to the people of that community. So see, for me, when I first accepted Christ, now we are looking back at 1970s, um, late mid 70s, when probably many of you were still not born. When I first accepted Christ, quite a few people told me, brother, have fellowship among believers, but they avoid the church because the church will always create problems and always is the root of all problems. Fortunately for me, I did not listen to them or obey them, but I always have been involved in the church. And the church has always been a blessed community to me. And believe me, I've been in all kinds of churches, being in the government. 
I keep, keep getting transferred every year or two. And so I have been in a variety of churches. Some of them are absolutely dead. Some of them were too much on fire. And in fact, one church in Delhi used to run from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. So it was all kinds of churches. But in every church I have, I've always found a community of believers. And it is with this community of believers that we have learned to grow and we have learned to share and we have learned to know what, it, what love means within the community of God. And it has been such a blessing for me that wherever I have been, my house has always been full of the community of God. As people come there, visit, we share, we discuss, we meet each other's needs which are there. And when I was in Haga Institute, I was traveling almost 20 days a month. Who looked after my family? My family was essentially looked after by the church. Every crisis, every need, every problem, the church would be there. And they would come and deal with it. That is essentially the kingdom of God and the presence of the love of the king, king, kingdom of God there. And the, uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 5, that God is taking us like bricks and building us into a kingdom, into the uh, church, into the community of God. And if I'm not being willing to get built into this community, then where am I? I'm just rebelling against God and I'm refusing to accept what God wants to do in my life. That is to make you and integrate you into being an active and a part of a community of people who love God. Now, if you look at the laws, one of the things they believe uh, Jesus said, love God and love man. And on these two commands, hang all the law and the prophets. So all these laws which are there in the Old Testament are essentially showing you how you are supposed to show love to each other. So basically these laws are meant for the community of God so that we understand what love means, what practical love means, and how do we practice this love within the community of God. So that if you look at Deuteronomy 4.6, it says, therefore, be careful to observe them. That means observe these laws. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So what happens when we live by the law which God has given us and show the love which we have for God's people and for God's community and the people outside and look at it and say, isn't it amazing the way these people live? Surely they are a great nation. Surely they are God's people. Surely God is in the midst of them. They are not saying that because you are a very great guy. They are saying that because they can see in this community the love of God which is being manifested. And so we need to understand that the kingdom, this community, is the essence of the gospel. And we need to understand that the kingdom is good news. The gospel's presence the good news is that of the kingdom, not just a cross. The cross is the entry into the kingdom. But the good news is essentially the kingdom. Now, from the church, blessings flow to the community. Right through the history of the church, you will find, or at least of the early church, if not the later church, right through the history of the early church, you will find that through the church, blessings flow to the community like it was meant to be, because the community of God is supposed to be a blessing to the community and to the people. If you look at Romans 12, 2, actually 1 and 2, Romans 12, 1 says to offer your body as a living sacrifice. And 12, the 2 says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you may understand what is the perfect will of God. So basically what is happening, you have the kingdom of God on one side, and you have the kingdom of the world on the other side, which is, includes your business and your work and all those kind of things. Now, God is saying, change the way in which you think. Stop thinking like the world and start thinking like a person who is a member of the kingdom of God. Which essentially means start thinking like God. Try to understand how God views things, how, what is God's perspective of the world around us. And when we start seeing things the way God does, then we start understanding what is the perfect will of God. And then what happens, your work is no longer now part of the world. It's not kingdom of the world. Your work becomes the kingdom of God because through your work, 
you are being a blessing to people. The blessing of God is flowing through you, through your profession, through your ministry, out to the people around you. And because you are a member of the kingdom of God, it's not about living to somehow get to heaven, but it is living to be a blessing, which the kingdom of God is meant to be. So that is basically what we understand as the kingdom of God and the kind of life which you need to be leading. Now this in John 17, 15 says that this does not mean that we leave this world, but we interpret and understand this world in the context of the kingdom. So I need to change my mindset and I need to start seeing everything which is there, my profession, my work, my family, my children, my neighbors, everything I need to start seeing in terms of the kingdom of God and in terms of what God is doing and not in terms of what I want and what I would like to see. So when you're looking at it in terms of what you want and what you'd like to see, you're basically thinking like the world. And the Bible is very clear that if you're thinking like the world, you cannot understand the things of God. It is only when you surrender your life to God and stop running after the material things of this world and start seeking the kingdom of God in your life that you'll start seeing things the way God sees it and you'll start understanding the reality of the kingdom. So we are involved in this world as ambassadors. That's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are representatives of Christ living here. And our whole life, whatever we do, is with this consciousness that I am an ambassador of the kingdom of God to the kingdom of this world. And I represent the kingdom of God to the kingdom of this world. And I'm a blessing to the people who are there around me because I'm a part of the kingdom. So that is the basic concept of the kingdom of God. Now, what does the Bible say about the kingdom of God? The Bible says, so instance, we are looking at Luke <clears throat> chapter 11, verse 20. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. <clears throat> One of the things which the Bible is saying that when the kingdom of God comes, you will find that evil is cast out. <clears throat> evil is chased away. And you'll find that the righteousness of, of God comes there. Which basically means that wherever you go, you need to see that you cast out evil. Then Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So many people think the kingdom of God means getting blessings from God. Kingdom of God doesn't mean getting blessings from God. Kingdom of God means being anointed and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work of God in your life, wherever you are. And that is what uh, we really need to recognize, that as members of the kingdom of God, the Spirit of God is working in me so that I can be a blessing to the people who are there. So the kingdom is seen in evil being cast out and not in opulence. So what happens when you are there, whether you're working in a profession or wherever you are, you will find that because you are there, evil gets stopped. See, I can give many stories, but, uh, but I remember one of the most interesting battles I had was when the railway minister wanted someone to be promoted who was working under me. But he was not the senior most, he was the second senior most. He wanted to supersede the senior most. And the person who was the senior most was reasonably good in his work, so there was no justification to supersede him. And so I said, it will not happen. And then that battle went on for several months. They tried to transfer me. They tried all kinds of things. But finally, that person was not promoted. To me, that is the kingdom of God. You are standing there and seeing that no evil is done to anyone, but righteousness and justice flows in your department because you are there. So that is the reality of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not heaven or getting to heaven. It is living the life which Jesus wants us to live here. It is standing for the values of the kingdom and seeing that the values of the kingdom are maintained in your department and in your life. And believe me, it's great fun because the world does not accept the values of the kingdom. So the moment you start standing for the values of the kingdom, you will start experiencing the power of God in your life because you're going to be fighting evil continuously, daily, and it's going to make your life exciting if you like excitement. 
So Matthew 13 and Colossians 1.13 also brings another very important concept. The kingdom is meant to grow invisibly by influence. So what happens? Because we are uh, people of the kingdom, and because we are doing ministry um, if through our life, wherever we are, and we are a blessing to the people all over, so you find that slowly the kingdom starts permeating into the world and it grows invisibly without doing any mighty projects and things like that. No, I'm not against projects. If you look in the Acts of the Apostle, it's very interesting that in Acts 8, persecution broke out. And because the persecution broke out, the church got scattered. And when the church got scattered, these people who were scattered took the gospel with them and started sharing the gospel wherever they went. And the church started growing. And that is basically the way I understand the parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13. That it just like yeast in a in a lump of dough, it permeates the whole world through the work of individuals who are members of the kingdom. And so we need to realize that every member of the church, not just evangelists, not just pastors, not just Bible teachers, but every member of the church needs to impact the world for the kingdom of God by his life and by his commitment to live by the values of the kingdom. Now, I'm, projects started, you will find in Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, you find the missionary project starts when they send Paul and Barnabas as missionaries. And so you find that both are there. One are projects and one is your life. But I personally believe the life must precede the project. Well, many people like to do projects because their life is, of, uh, is not there. And they want to kind of ease their conscience that I'm not living as a Christian, but at least I support Christian work. I don't think that's what either God wants, nor is it what is going to help the kingdom of God. We need to be witnesses by our life, wherever we are, because the kingdom of God is present is there when you are there. Now, many people don't like to think of the church as a kingdom. Basically, they say that the kingdom of God is the fellowship of believers worldwide, and uh, the church is all full of uh, corruption and I don't know what not. Personally, I believe that the church is the physical manifestation of the kingdom. I cannot love a vague person who is a believer somewhere in the world. I can love a concrete person who is struggling with sin and who is in my presence and who is a part of me with the congregation. And so for me, the church is the kingdom. And that is where I practice love. You know, Jesus said, you must love your enemy. I said, if I cannot love my fellow church members who annoy me so much by their lifestyle, how am I going to love my enemies? And to me, the church is a kind of a, a labor laboratory where you are being tested to see whether you have the love of God in you to be able to accept people who are different from you and radically different from you, but yet they are believers in Christ. And so you accept them. The church is not a building. So never ever think of the church as a building or an institution. The church is a community of God's people. So always think in terms of community, think of people. Don't think of the building or the institution. And that is something which we need to remember very clearly. Well, most people tend to think of the church as a building. I'm going to church. So I'm not going to church to be in that building. I'm going to church to fellowship with people, to meet people, to share my life with people, to let them share their life with me. That is what the community of God is about. And that is why I'm going to church. And the very important thing where people tend to forget. See, church is where we give worship. We give to the kingdom, not get. Most people look at a church as something where you get. I get fed. So I pay my tithe to the place where I get fed. I said, listen, you died in Christ, so don't worry about your feeding. Worry about feeding others. If I, I'm giving worship, you give worship by giving things, by giving love to people by being generous with people, by touching the lives of people. That is how you give worship to God. Not by running from church to church where you can get a good sermon. That is pure selfishness and got nothing to do with Christianity. Running after great speakers 
is total selfishness and got nothing to do with Christianity. If you really want to worship God, go to church and start showing love to the people, start showing love to the pastor, start showing love and respect to people and see how you can be a blessing to the people. That is what we are supposed to be doing in church, not getting. Now, I know you will get, you will get some very good, great blessings in the church, but that's not what we are going for. We are going to give blessings to people. So this is something I tell people that we need to keep in mind. See, remember what Jesus did in John 13, 14. He washed the feet of the disciples, apostles or disciples, and he told them, do this to each other. He said, we need to be washing the feet of the other members of the church. But if I'm not even going to church regularly, how can I wash their feet? How do I wash a person's feet? Not by taking water and mug and washing his feet. I wash a person's feet by listening to his problems, giving him a shoulder to cry on, by encouraging him in his life, by sharing the word of God with him, whatever I know, by teaching. See, if you look in the most of churches, Sunday school is always looking for volunteers. VBS is always looking for volunteers. Most Bible studies are dying because nobody is there. Why can't you go there and wash each other's feet? That is the community of God of which we are a part of. And if you really believe you're a part of the community of God, you will be available for Sunday school. You'll be available for VBS. You'll be available for whatever programs the church organizes. And you'll tell me, but brother, I don't have the gift of teaching. I said, even I don't have the gift of teaching, which you'd have probably realized by now. But I taught. I have always taught in Sunday school. And even till uh, the COVID started, I was teaching the intermediate class in Sunday school. It has always been, and believe me, I'm not a great teacher, but you make the effort. You let God use you by washing each other's feet. So a church is not an a la carte restaurant, but a community. It's a family. And Rome, but I has died. If you have died in Christ in baptism, you're not looking for something where you will get a benefit, where you'll get fed. You are looking for a place where you can be a benefit, where you can be a blessing to people. And that's what a church is, a place where you go out and you bless people and uh, you are a blessing to the community. Now, other thing you'll talk, see about the kingdom of God, it says in Luke 10, 9, and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. 1 Corinthians 1.5 says, For the gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. See, one of the big mistakes we make is to kind of think that this power of God is given to us individually, and we think that, do I have the power or do he have the power and all that? I said, I don't worry about myself. I said, I died. So I'm not worried about myself. I'm available for God to use. And I know that God's power is in the church. God's power is in the community. And since I believe that God's power is there in the community, I start exercising it. And I start living as I call it in the realm of the impossible. And you'll be amazed at what all happens when you start living in the realm of the impossible. If you live in the realm of the possible, you don't really need God. But the kingdom of God basically is the power of God for miracles, the power of God for a changed life. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 1.5. You will get victory over your sins, you'll get victory over temptation, and you'll have tremendous experiences in your life. You know, I have a friend, which I told you about a, my crazy church in Delhi, where it was 10 in the morning to 10 in the night. So they used to go out for street preaching in the evening. And this happened actually just before we joined the church. My friend in Hyderabad, uh, Stanley Benjamin, he was, went along with a pastor on the street preaching. And then they preached the gospel. And the, since that church believes that uh, in miracles and healing, they said that God can heal people. So the crowd brought one boy and said the boy is deaf, heal him. You said that you can heal him, heal him. So pastor coolly turned to Stanley Benjamin and told him, brother, lay hands and pray for him. Now Stanley Benjamin was hoping that he'll have a Cora like experience where the earth will open up and swallow him, but he didn't know what to do. But 
Anyways, pastor is standing there and everyone is looking at him. He didn't know what to do. He just laid hands and prayed. And they laid hands and prayed. And then the tested to see if the boy could hear. And the boy could hear. See, I tell people, you are not a miracle worker. The miracle worker is God. So don't worry about whether you have gifts or not. In fact, see, I'm not an athlete. And right through my school days, I always came last in the races. But believe me, if my house catches fire, I'll run. So everyone can exercise the gift to some extent. So don't, in fact, I had a very interesting experience that one of my staff in Chennai, uh, again, this is, must have been around 1980. Uh, he came to me and said, sir, my daughter has suddenly started getting epileptic fits. So I said, okay, then I sent him to every healer I could, I knew of in Chennai to send him to Dinakaran and to send him to various Dinakaran's offshoots. And literally for one year, he went to every possible preacher I knew in Chennai who claimed to have the gift of healing. At the end of one year, he said, sir, I've been all over and the girl is not healed. But the only last alternative is you pray. He brought the girl with him and said, you pray. So I laid hands and prayed. After a month, he came back and said, after you prayed, brother, all of the epileptic fits have vanished. There's no epilepsy. Now, I don't have a gift of healing. I don't have anything. Well, I have just faith in God. And I said, you just lay hands and pray. See, this is the kingdom of God. And if you have the confidence of the kingdom of God, you will start exercising it by praying. If you don't pray for miracles, you'll never experience it in your life. And you don't really need God in your life. You can lead your life like any other human being. But you will find that God speaks, that God does things. Yeah, I had, uh, like going to office one day, God told me to turn around and go back home. Those days, no mobile phone, no nothing. And I was wondering, go home, what do I tell my wife? God told me to go home. I went home and I found somebody waiting for me who had come to see me all the way from Chennai. And I, we were in Delhi. And so I rang up office and said, I'm not coming. And I spent a day with him discussing various things in his life. So that is the kind of power of God which you will see as the reality of the kingdom of God in us. So the kingdom of God is not something which I, I go to when I'm dead and when I'm buried. It's something I start experiencing now in the present. And this is, and the most important thing to transform life. See, miracles are secondary. The most important thing is the way in which your life is transformed as you give up on the things of this world and start living for God. See, what are the implication of this? Number one, Matthew 7, 1 to 6 says, do not judge others. So we are, because we are members of the kingdom of God, we don't judge others, we don't fight with others, we don't condemn others. We accept everyone. In fact, uh, Matthew 6, 19 to 24 says, if your eye is evil, your life is full of darkness. But if your eye is sound, then your life is full of light. So what does this I being evil mean? If you look in Matthew 20, when the person was paying the workers in the vineyard the same amount of money, whether they worked for one hour or whether they worked for the full day, the people who worked for the full day grumbled. There you find that the master says, why is your I evil? So basically understand the I being evil as being lacking generosity. If your eye is lacks generosity and you only look at people to find faults and mistakes in them, your life is full of darkness. The kingdom of God is not there. But when your eye is generous and you overlook mistakes and you look at the strengths of people, then your life is full of light and experience the presence of the kingdom of God in your life. So this is what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God and the community of God that we don't go around judging people and condemning people. We accept people. Our eye does not lack generosity, but we look at people with generosity. And what happens? Basically, we are unable to accept others because of pride. And pride basically comes because we have got extreme lack of self-confidence and poor self-esteem. So we need to recognize that we have been created by God as a unique person for a unique purpose by God. That's what Psalm 139 says. And since we have been uniquely created by God, I don't have to compare myself with others. I don't need to have low self-esteem. 
I have been made by God for a purpose and I am unique. So you need to claim that uniqueness and get over your pride and get over your low self-esteem and then you'll be able to be generous and you'll be able to accept people. So the second thing I tell people is that many people struggle to accept others because they have not forgiven themselves and they're carrying that guilt with them. And as they carry that guilt with them, they find it very difficult to accept others who are doing better than them. So just like you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your life, you need to stand before a mirror and tell yourself, God has forgiven me. I forgive myself. God has accepted me. I accept myself as I am. I don't need to be different, but I'm going to live for God. And when you put away your mistakes and your sins or the past behind you and look to the future, you will stop judging others. You will stop looking down on others. You will be an encouragement to them like Barnabas. And you will become a genuine member of the kingdom of God who is a blessing to people. So you need to be a person who sees good in others, not bad. And try and practice that 24 by 7. That all the time, try and see the good in others, not the bad. It is much easier to see the bad, but not the good. And believe me, if you cannot find a church in which you fit, the problem is you. Because the church is the body of Christ. And if you're not able to find a church where you fit in, that is definitely a problem with you and you to deal with that. The last item I want to touch was this whole idea of fights and battles which go on within the church. See, I've been in many churches and a lot of battles keep going on. I just ignore the battles. I keep doing the ministry. I want to be a blessing and I keep try to be a blessing there and rarely get involved in the problem of battles. But why do these quarrels come? According to James 4, 1 to 4, these quarrels come because you're fighting about worldly things. So you just stop fighting about worldly things. You run away from the world. So why do you want to fight about it? In 1 Corinthians 6, 7, Paul says, why don't you rather suffer wrong? If you are suffering, losing something of the world, lose it. We have renounced the world. But don't fight in the church, not in the community of God. We are supposed to be a blessing in the community of God. So we never, ever fight in the church. And uh, I know in my church in Hyderabad, once they chased away the pastor and there was all kinds of things going on. Believe me, I never got involved. And I annoyed everyone by refusing to get involved. Uh, they said, you have to take sides. I said, I don't take sides. I'm here to do ministry, not to take sides and not to fight. And, you know, we tend to justify ourselves saying, brother, I'm not fighting for myself. I'm fighting for justice. I'm fighting for uh, the properties which are being lost. Then let the properties go by. Yeah. Once all the properties are gone, there'll be no fights left. But the kingdom of God, we need to preserve. In fact, 1 Corinthians 3.16, talking about the church, Paul says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And there's one of the reasons why I refuse to fight in church. I refuse to get involved in fights in church. I am there to do ministry. I am there to be a blessing to people, not to be a problem to people. And I'm, see, when we understand the kingdom of God, we'll understand what this is. Now, I spoke yesterday about the year of Jubilee and the land loss. But I want to see how can we apply what I said yesterday in the church. Do everyone in your church have the opportunity of education? Can you see that the sextants children do not become sextants but become engineers? Can you see that your security guard who is there in your church, his children become engineers and doctors and then become security guards also? Do we see that is the kingdom of God? That is the power of the kingdom of God. And that is the love which we have. The government has promulgated, promulgated the right of education. Can we ensure that every child in our church has an education which he deserves? What does Marx deserve? You know, see, many people are failing in school and wanting to be engineers. I said, what does Marx deserves? Can we see that he gets the education which Marx deserves? See, this is something which I feel as a part of the kingdom of God we need to see. People are suffering because of medical bills. 
they didn't fall sick because they wanted to fall sick, they fell sick. Can we see that people are helped? In fact, one of the beautiful things which I see in our church in Hyderabad, that every Sunday doctors make themselves available for free uh, treatment of pay, uh, church members. So the church members will come and they will give, give them advice and uh, prescriptions. See, these are the kind of things which shows the reality of the community. And we need to be touching lives through emotional healing by listening to them, by praying with them. And can we be available to people? I'm terrible at that because I am not a conversationalist. But still, I have people who are normally in touch with me for help, for blessings, for teaching. See, these are simple things. We don't need some great gifts for doing this. It just means being human and being available to people. People should be talking about us. If you look at Julian de Apostate, who was the grandson of uh, Constantine, he renounced Christ, and so he's known as Julian de Apostate. And he writes in his uh, one of the writings, it is disgraceful when no Jew is a beggar, and the impious Galileans, the Galileans when he's talking about are the Christians, the impious Christians support our poor in addition to their own. Not only are they looking after the Christian poor, they're looking after our poor also. And everyone is able to see that our co-religionists are in want of aid from us. That we pagans are not helping our people, but the Christians are. So that is the kind of testimony which Julian the Apostate gives of the church which he hated. People should be talking about us. They should be talking about the kind of person you are. Uh, this is also in the fourth century. All day long, some of them, the Christians, tended to the dying and to the burial. Countless numbers with no one to care for them. Others gathered together from all parts of the city, a multitude of those withered from famine and distributed bread to them all. During a plague in the fourth century, everyone ran away. Only the Christians remained to look after them because that is the power of the kingdom of God being manifested in their lives. And we need to have people talking about us. But where is the kingdom of God in India? I want you to take a look at this. And I'll be closing with this, so don't run away, Mega. Yeah, the, this was an article that came in the Indian Express that the suicide rate is 50% higher for Christians in India. Believe me, it's not 50%, it's 70%. This is the actual report from 2014. The government statistics of 2014, Christians had the highest suicide rate of 174 compared to Hindus at 11.3. The national average was 10.6. Muslims were at 7% and Sikhs at 4% respectively. My point is, where is the kingdom of God? If the kingdom of God is the power of God, if the kingdom of God is the love of God, why are people, Christians committing suicide? Why is the drug addiction rate highest among Christians? Why is the percentage of Christians in jail the highest? among all religious members. If you look at every statistic in India, we are doing what Jesus said. We go and convert people and make them twice the children of hell. Something is wrong. The kingdom of God is not manifesting itself. If the kingdom of God manifested itself, nobody would commit suicide in the church because they'll find so much emotional help. They'll find so much emotional strength. They'll find so many people who are willing to stretch out a hand and reach out to them. They are not finding it. And the fact is that the Christians are the worst testimony in the country. Can we do something about it? Stop hiding our faces and start facing reality. The kingdom has, has come. That's what Jesus said, the kingdom has come, but a majority of the people cannot see it. It's invisible to them. They can only experience it through you. You are the one who has to reach the kingdom to them. It can only go to them through you, not through other evangelists and all who will never get to meet your friends. You are the one who meets them. They need to experience it through you. Have you entered the kingdom and seen its reality? Has all bitterness disappeared from your life and the love of God replaced all anger? Do you have the peace of God in your life? Are you a blessing to people and your church? Especially to your church, are you a blessing? Are you an active member of your community? Are you available to your pastor or head if he has a need? These are questions which you need to sincerely ask yourself. And if you have not entered the kingdom, I invite you to do so 
during the singing of the hymn. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this evening. We do pray, Lord, that as we have been thinking and looking at the kingdom, help, Lord, each member, Lord, who is here listening to this message, that they would actively be part of the kingdom and be a blessing, Lord, to the members in the church, that the statistics which are there, which shows the church in such a poor light, would be transformed, Lord, and we'll find that the church is a vibrant community which experiences the presence of God in them continuously, all the time, through the people, Lord, who are there, through its members who are leading it a powerful life with the anointing, Lord, of the Holy Spirit. We do thank you, Lord. We do praise you. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen.